The Five Great Lessons by Kat, Anna, Ellen, Aubrey, and Alexis. The very first great lesson comes from Mario Montessori. Now, Mario Montessori shared this story as he remembered his mother telling it to him. It was in December of 1958 in the issue of the AMI publication in the communication section that Mario shared this cosmic tale that his mom used to tell to the children. Now, when looking and trying to look for what's the very first great lesson, there's actually a couple different ones that you're gonna find. There's gonna be one that's an original that Maria Montessori um, the first one she told, and that one is called God Who Has No Hands. But since then, Mario Montessori actually made his own, and that one has to do more with evolution. But what I'm going to be sharing today is the one that I have found that has to do with Maria Montessori sharing what hers was like. Now, the reason why I want to share this one is, first, it goes, relates more to my beliefs, and it's the true, the closest, truest form we have of the very first great lesson, the one that she made. And so that's why I wanted to share this with you guys today. So this story should be told in one sitting and it should be told within the first week students arrive in the elementary classroom. Now how this is presented, it's presented more like a tale, like a story. And within this story, you start off with narration. And then within the narration, you go more into explaining. And then after explaining, you go into pictures. So the kids can visualize what is happening. Now, I would love to share this whole entire thing with you. However, it's like 30 minutes long. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little condensed version. And so, this is something that's really long and there's lots of pieces to it. So I'm just going to give you guys a little snippet of what it's like to tell the story of God who has no hands. So in the beginning, there was God. Since he was completely perfect and completely happy, there was nothing he needed. Yet out of the goodness of his heart, he chose to create and he chose to create all that willed and all that he willed came into being. The heavens and the earth, all that is visible, all that is even invisible. One after another, he made the light, the stars, the sky, and the earth with its plants and animals. But last, he made man. Man, like animals, was made out of particles of the earth. But God made him different from the animals like himself. For into his body, which he would die, he breathed a soul that would never, ever die. Now, many people thought this was just a tale. How could someone with no eyes, no hands make things? If God is a spirit who can be seen, who cannot be seen or touched or heard, how could he have made the stars that sparkled overhead? the sea which is always astir, the sun, the mountains, and the wind. How could a spirit make the birds and fishes and the trees, the flowers and the scent they shed around them? Perhaps it would make sense if he made invisible things since he is an invisible being. But then how could he make the visible world? It is all very well, they thought to say, that God is everywhere, but who has set their eyes upon him? No one has seen him, so how can we be sure he is everywhere? They tell he is the master, whom everybody and everything obeys. But why on earth should we believe that? And it really does seem impossible. We, have, we who have hands could not do the things that he did. So how could someone who has no hands make all these things? It just doesn't make sense. And can we imagine animals and plants and rocks obeying God? The animals do not understand when we talk to them. So 
how could they be obedient to him? Or the winds and the sea and the mountains. You can shout and scream and wave your arms at them, but they can't hear you, for they are not even alive, and they certainly won't obey you. But yes, this is how it seems to us. But as you will see, everything that exists, whether it has life or not, in all that it does, by the very fact of its being there, actually obeys the will of God. God's creatures do not know that they are obeying though. Those that are just go on existing. Those that have life move and go on living. Yet, every time a cool wind brushes your cheek, its voice, if we could hear it, it would be saying, Lord, I obey. When the sun rises in the morning and the colors fill the sky, it is saying, my Lord, I obey. And when you see a bird and its wings or fruit falling from a tree or a little tiny butterfly hovering over a flower, it is saying, my Lord, I obey. Now, at first in the world, there was chaos and darkness. And this chaos and darkness was on the face of the deep. But then God said, let there be light. And there was light. But before that, there was only deep. A large space with no beginning, with no end. It was dark and cold. Who can imagine something so, so dark and so, so cold? Now, when we think of dark, we think of night. But our night would be like brilliant sunshine in comparison with darkness. When we think of cold, we think of ice. But ice is positively hot if you compare it with the coldness of space. The space that separates the stars, as hot, you might say, as a blazing furnace from which no heat can escape. In this measureless void of cold and darkness, light was created. There appeared something like a vast fiery cloud, which included the stars that are in the sky. The whole universe was in that cloud. And among the tiniest of stars was our own world. But they were not stars then. As yet, there was nothing except light and heat. So intense was the heat that all the substances we know, iron, gold, earth, rocks, water, existed as gases. All of these substances, all like the material of which the earth and the stars are composed, were fused together in one vast flaming intensity of light and heat, a heat which we could make our sun today feel like a piece of ice. This raging fiery cloud of nothingness, too huge to imagine, moved in the immensity of freezing space, which was also nothingness. But the fiery mass was no bigger than a drop of water in the ocean of space, but that drop continued the earth and all of the stars. As this cloud of light and the heat moved through this empty space, little drops fell from it. If you swing the water out of a glass, some of it breaks up and separates into little droplets. The countless hosts of stars are like these, little droplets, only instead of falling out of a glass when it moves. They're falling constantly moving around in space in such a way that they can never meet because they are millions of miles away from each other. Indeed, some stars are so far away from us that it takes a million years for their light to reach us. Did you know how fast light travels? It doesn't travel 100 miles per hour, not even 200 miles per hour. No, much, much faster. It travels 186,000, but not per hour, per second. Imagine how fast it is. It means that in one second, if you travel seven times around the whole earth, whole world, and do you know how big the world is? It is so big. If we were to drive at 100 miles per hour continuously all day long 
and all day night it would take us more than 10 days to cover that whole distance and yet the light covers it in covers it seven times in just one second just a click with your fingers and it's gone and it is around the earth seven times already so can you imagine how far some of these stars are that it takes their light one million years just to reach us then there are so many stars that scientists have calculated that if each of them were a grain of sand all the stars together would cover up all the states from Virginia to New York up to the height of 200 meters one of these stars one of these grains of sand among those thousands of billions of grains of sand is our sun and this right here is a picture of our sun and this sun is so big that just one of its flames could contain 22 earths so just one of these flames could contain 22 of the earth that we live on So that's where I'm going to stop. But this goes into states of matter. It goes into forces of attraction. It goes into a model of a liquid. It goes into the state of a matter. And it goes into the dancing of elements. And then it goes into weights and liquids. And then it even goes into forces of particles. And when you talk about this, you use baking soda and vinegar, um, food coloring, a volcano model and white dish detergent. Uh, you also go in to talk about volcanoes mixed with water. And when it all concludes, it talks about that rocks, water, air, solids, liquid, and gases today, as it was yesterday and the millions years ago, God's laws are obeyed in the same exact way. The world spins around itself and around and around the sun. And today, as it was thousands years ago, the earth and all its elements and compounds it is made of, as they fulfill their task, they all whisper in one's voice, Lord, thy will be done, we obey. Hi everybody, I'm gonna be talking to you about the second great lesson which obviously follows the first grade lesson. The second grade lesson follows the creation of the universe and planet Earth. The aim of this lesson is to teach children how life originally formed on our planet, eventually leading to the teaching of the diversity of life on our planet through botany, biology, and habitats. An important component when teaching this lesson is teaching children how the emphasis on how every living being on our planet, then and now, has contributions to make to our planet. This is also called the cosmic task. So at the beginning of the second great lesson, our earth was a pearl. Sun, water, air, rock, all debated about what their jobs were or what, what rules they might follow. They were very concerned when water started forming on the crust of the earth. Then something wonderful happened. As the water rushed over the Earth's surface, the salt and minerals that were being brushed into the water turned into tiny single-celled beings, which actually served as the basis for life on our planet. The second great lesson uses the timeline of life that breaks down, the, also known as the Book of Earth, which break down, breaks down the eras, evolutions, and period of change of life on our planet. Through this timeline, children can learn about microorganisms, plants, dinosaurs, and eventually the life of mammals. When teaching this lesson, teachers will begin with the timeline of life rolled up. The teacher will unroll the timeline only to expose the life, uh, life to the Cambrian period. From here, the teacher will then point to the amoeba, a one-celled creature with no shell, the teacher will continue to unroll the timeline until the age of invertebrates is completely visible. Eventually, the teacher will work through all periods on the timeline. 
the teacher will conclude the lesson by moving her hand over the entire timeline and pointing out to children how humans could not live in other periods on the timeline. All these things had to happen in order for man to come. And so here we are. All these periods before us had prepared Earth for us and we are now part of the story. A few considerations when giving the second great lesson is the time restraints and how you plan to teach it. Um, it is fairly lengthy because of the length of, of the timeline, so you might find it more appropriate to break the timeline into various periods and going into more detail on individual days. You also might go into a higher level of detail with your third graders, um, maybe as opposed to providing a brief overview or a high level overview for your first graders. You also might consider using real fossils from each time period to provide children with um, a visual of what type of life came from that particular period. The story of humans is the third great lesson that adds to the story of our origin and past. As with other great lessons, the story of humans was created by Mario Montessori and is designed to introduce educational content and inspire further exploration and study. Also like other great lessons, the story of humans is officially taught at the elementary level and beyond, but Montessori teachers are encouraged to lay the foundation for these lessons in the primary classroom as well. Since the story of humans is meant to be told as a captivating story that stimulates the child's interest and imagination, I thought it would be fun to explain it with a type of storytelling technique. So here we go. So here we are with my handy dandy whiteboard. We know that the story of humans is encompassed within the story of life on earth, which is encompassed within the story of our universe. The lesson invites the learner to explore the answers to certain questions about themselves. Who am I? Where do I come from? Why am I here? Montessori also recognized the importance of telling the story of humans from the very beginning in prehistoric times, rather than starting with written history. To answer these questions and set up, and set up the study of ancient humans, the student must first have a basic understanding of the story of life, which is the second great lesson, and of archaeology. From their knowledge of taxonomy and anatomy gained in the story of life, they learned that our closest living relatives on Earth are the chimpanzee and gorilla. This knowledge will come in handy later as they learn of the characteristics of the earliest humans and how they compare to these relatives of ours. To form an understanding of archaeology, Students are introduced to the tools and techniques of the trade through hands-on learning or simu simulations of archaeological dig sites. This experience demonstrates how we have found clues and evidence of our human history from hundreds to thousands to millions of years ago. Finally, with this knowledge in hand, the great lesson of the story of humans is ready to commence. As stated before, our story begins with a look at our earliest ancestors through the study of fossil records. Our knowledge of these prehistoric ancestors is currently evolving with our most recent major discovery being that of a new species called Homo naledi in 2015. Homo, Homo naledi, also known as Starman, is now considered to be the first human in our timeline and therefore the start of the story of humans. Next, this great lesson follows through with the story of Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo sapiens, which is us today. The story of our most ancient ancestor to ourselves highlights the changes of anatomy the development of technology, like the use of tools and the use of fire, and shifts in thinking, like the development of symbolic expressions and belief systems. Once the foundation of our prehistoric ancestors from the Paleolithic to Neolithic period is set, the story of humans continues into modern history. In cosmic education, this modern history, which covers 
the ancient ages, medieval ages, and contemporary ages, is also considered our written, written history. And it is noted how little of this timeline history spans. A mere 5,000 years compared to the two plus million years we have been on Earth. Finally, an important parallel to the historical understanding of the story of humans is that of the human biology. Again, this is generally presented in upper elementary Montessori schools, but as one might guess, human biology is covers the study of human body and its systems and functions. The story of humans is told through the lens of our history, both ancient and modern, and our biology. It is meant to emphasize the wonder of the human body, connecting our functions and our story to the story of universe as it unfolds. And this is the third great lessons. The third great lesson, the story of humans. Hello everyone, before I continue, let's review what we've learned so far. So we first started off talking about how the world came to be, how earth came to be. Then we talked about plants and animals and how they now live in and on the earth. Then we just got done talking about the coming of the human beings. So we're gonna continue on. This is the next great lesson, the lesson, great lesson number four. And we're gonna talk about communication and signs and language and how the way we talk and communicate with others has evolved and progressed over time. We didn't have words and sounds to begin with. All we had was pictures, something that was called a pictograph. What happened was, is way back then, they didn't have all the things we have now. They had sand and dirt and they had their hands. And so the very first way that they were able to talk with each other, communicate, was through pictures. They would, they would draw a sun in the sand or draw a picture of a fish. But the problem was is that these things weren't permanent. And if I had something that I wanted to tell somebody else but they weren't there with me right there, I had no way to be able to remember or no way to communicate that. Because if I would write it in the sand or dirt and the next day it would be gone. It would The wind would either blow the sand away or the rain would wash up what I drew in the dirt. So language had to continue to evolve and move. And so it became more permanent. Instead of just using their hands and what was around them, they began to use rocks and they began to use paint and they began to use pens and be able to use what was around them, such as caves, to carve out what they were trying to say so that their messages were able to last longer and they'd be able to be more permanent. I have a picture here of what that kind of looked like. So right here, we have a picture of beautiful, beautiful painting that's on a cave. But as we know, language has evolved. It hasn't, it hasn't stayed like this. So about 5,000 years ago, a group of people called the Egyptians lived in Northern Africa and along the banks of the Nile River. And they made lots and lots of pictures. Some of them were carved and sewn, some of them were painted, and some of them were painted on paper. And they used the stones from the land around them. And the paper was made from the papyrus plant that grew near the river. They first painted pictures on this paper with a brush and then later invented the pen. Now, if we all would close our eyes, if we would all picture a fish, all of our fishes would look so different. Some of, us, some of them would have two eyes, some of them would have one, some of them would have many fins, some of them would have none. And so language had to evolve because if I was telling a story, I would use my own pictures, but somebody else may look at those pictures and tell a different story. And so the same message wasn't being portrayed every single time. It was maybe changed here and there every way along the line. So now comes letters and sounds. And so the first thing that came was something called the Phoenician alphabet. And let me show you a picture of that. So here now we have symbols and we have names for the letters. And that was, that's what came next after the pictograph. Well, after that, we had the Greek and the Roman and the modern alphabet. 
language is constantly evolving and progressing. It didn't stay where it was before. And if you guys think about it, we first started communicating with our hands and by looking at our environment. Then we made communication a little bit more permanent by putting it on rocks in our environment. Well now, it, it's evolved even more. We have technology now to help aid and support that, allow communication to stand the test of time. We're now able to pass down stories and books through text and by typing so that we can continue getting our message across or continue sharing stories. And it's so, so cool that we're able to do that. And that language didn't just stop or stay at pictures, but it's continued to grow. And even now, there's words that we have that some of the people in our the older generation don't know about. They may say, what is that? I've never heard of that word. What does it mean? So even the vocabulary and the way we talk continues to change and it doesn't say the same. And so every single year, and from even when I was a child and this lesson was introduced to now, things are different. The way we talk, the words that are in our vocabulary have changed. And that's why this is so, so important because the language, the way we communicate is gonna constantly evolve. It's gonna constantly change and it's not gonna stay the same. And we just have to know and reflect on how amazing it is that we're able to even just sit here together, listen to each other, and just dialogue together without having to draw pictures. This would take so much longer if I had to draw a picture for every single thing I said. And quite frankly, I don't think I would have gotten my message across today. So it's so amazing that language has transformed and it has grown and that it did start. And it's just so important that we understand that we were made to communicate. Way back then, they wanted a connection with each other. They wanted a way to share what was going on in their lives. And we want that today too. And so that's why I believe Maria Montessori made this part of the five great lessons. That we have a desire within us to communicate. We have a desire within us to connect, whether we're a teacher or a child. All of us want a relationship. And the greatest thing we can do for our kids is allow them to communicate with others, allow them to be able to express their thoughts and feelings. And that's why we have language today. Here we are at the fifth grade lesson. It's considered our second greatest accomplishment. Can you guess the first? You got it, communication through signs, where communication was done so through pictures and images and eventually letters. In addition to this, we needed a language to discuss discoveries that were made, to talk about quantities and distance. When negotiating trades, we needed a way to represent quantity we're not quite sure when exactly this came to be, but we know that in ancient times, the Sumerian, the Egyptians, the Chinese, the Romans, they all needed a way to communicate numbers. This was done in a few different ways. So here I'll show you the Mayala people who used stones. One was represented with one stone, Two was represented with two stones. Three was represented by three stones. Others use notches on a rope or a stick. While this worked for some, to some degree, for some time it was not enough. This is when we began to see written representations of numerals. For example, Babylonian people used symbols to represent numbers. So here we see number 10, 10, 60, and a combination of 23. The Greeks used the beginning letter of the name of the numeral to be the written representation of the number. For example, here you see 
the letter representation of the D sound. The name of the letter is Delta. This triangle symbol represents 10 or in Greek, Deca. The written representation, the Delta symbol, was the written representation of the number 10. And we see how the written numbers continue to evolve in the use of Roman numerals. We still see the use of Roman numerals in literature and in old buildings throughout our country. The way that numbers evolve is quite fascinating. You most likely give this lesson to an elementary student. It may be a difficult concept for the younger children in primary to fully understand because of how abstract it can be. But if I were to teach this in the primary classroom, I would simply explain that numbers are symbols to represent quantity. I would show charts such as the ones that I showed you today and explain that these two are symbols that represent quantity. The lesson will have to be as tactile as possible for our younger students to fully understand it. This would definitely support them as they begin to learn number sounds through number rods, beat stairs, sandpaper numbers, and many, many math works that they will come across in their Montessori education. To close today, I want to read a quote from Children of the Universe on page 35. Here's what it says. In other words, in the view of Montessori herself and others, it is pointless to argue over how many great lessons there should be. There is only one story, the comprehensive story of the changing universe itself. And the division into separate lessons is just the way we humans must proceed to make it accessible and understandable. What that means is that there may be many great lessons we can teach the kids, and we just have it broken down into five different things. But at the core, the reason why we're doing this is to let our students know, let the children know, that they have the ability to change things. They have the ability to make something that is okay better. And through every single one of these, they can see that they have a part to play or where they fit in in this whole story and all the lessons that we teach.